the U.S. dollar is our currency, but you're a problem. Emerging and low-income countries go to the capital markets without building the underlying infrastructure that is needed to be able to bring down some of this cost. And so the liquidity and sustainability facility that I created, it's like a repo market. You can actually, once you buy uh, a sovereign wealth uh, a bond from a country, you can repo it, which means you can resell it, you can make it more liquid, which attracts a totally different uh, class of uh, asset managers into those markets, brings more capital in, creates more competition and you know drives down prices. But we need a lot more of this sort of capital markets regulation to make sure that uh, that works. Another very important point that is happening is, you know, Basel regulation now says if you lend to emerging and low-income countries because the risk is higher, your liquidity coverage ratio has to be higher. And we have now segmented what we call high-quality liquid assets. And it's different high-quality liquid assets for emerging economy and low-income and for developed countries, which makes it even more difficult. So we're now trying to put in legislation that will take that away. And I think these are some of the things that we hope that with sort of innovation will allow for, you know, cheaper. Because the issue is debt is good if you use it well and if it's cheaper and long-term, because that's the only way that you grow. Developing. The Bank of International Settlements has changed the Basel III requirements. They are making banks use more high-quality liquid assets as collateral for low-income and emerging nations. Now, this puts a heavy load on these nations because every time they accept a loan, those loans are going to cost more because the banks have to put up more collateral for each loan. That's put up more high quality liquid assets to back each loan. And what she's saying is the rules need to change. Technology is here that can help this situation out by the tokenization, by allowing open protocols to tokenize assets, you would be able to turn assets into tokens and then have infrastructure that allows these tokens to be converted to currency more quickly and more efficiently. And long term, because that's the only way that you grow. Developing and development institutions, the World Bank and the IMF do not have enough resources for growth in these countries. So we have to go to markets. So the most important innovation has to be how we make markets more amenable and more accessible to this country so that we can access the $136 trillion. So the one Creating markets that are open and accessible for everyone is going to be done with crypto protocols. That's the purpose of a crypto protocol is making an open and accessible internet that is open for everybody to use. And this is why Africa is going to start tokenizing a lot of their assets. And these are going to be real world assets. You're going to see a lot of their commodities put on chain and tokenized. And these markets are going to be open for everybody. And this has already been done. Maker, Dow, Ave, Celo, Ripple have all created markets in Africa And this is just going to expand at a rapid pace and laws are going to get recalibrated and readjusted for these new technologies. Before we continue the show, I'd like to take a moment to thank NordVPN. NordVPN is not just a VPN service. They offer things like threat protection, which is real time. It monitors every website that you're going to to make sure that there's no threats that you're clicking on and warns you if you're about to click something that is potentially hazardous to your computer. There's over 6,300 NordVPN servers around the world, and you're going to have access to your favorite content wherever you go. Some content's geo-blocked, so it's important to have a VPN to make sure that you can get to your content, the content that you want to see. You can secure over 10 devices with one NordVPN package, so be sure to check out nordvpn.com slash Darren. If you choose the two-year package, you'll get four extra months for free. So make sure to check out nordvpn.com slash Darren. There's a 30-day money-back guarantee. The link is in the description below. Maybe one specific thing uh, that we're looking at, I think it's a combination of over time, as more clients, more investor types across various you know, uh, archetypes, some of the big institutions, their education and research journey, some of our wealth advisory partners, 
there on their own to her diligence and education journey. And those will slowly play out. Um, in the early days, it's been a lot of sort of end investor direct and, and ultra high net worth. And that's going to evolve as more investors get comfortable with the asset. Robbie, thank you. Robbie Michnick is a Ripple advisor, but he also works for BlackRock. What I find interesting about BlackRock is they're one of the largest asset managers in the entire world. And once they got involved with Bitcoin ETFs, that's when we started seeing regulations pass in the United States. And that's because they have regulatory capture. You see, the bigger guys, the incumbents, capture the regulators and they tell them what laws to make, what to iron out. And that's why we saw Bitcoin ETFs get passed because BlackRock was ready to have the ETFs pass. And this is going to happen with other parts of crypto. You're going to see this with real world assets. Recently, BlackRock partnered with Securitize, Ondo Finance, and you're going to see real world assets also get defined with regulatory clarity from the United States because BlackRock, as well as other incumbents, control the regulators. They're in control of the United States. It's not public and private. Private controls the public sector. And the public sector may have somewhat of a say. But there's this revolving door between private and public sector. Once Robbie Michnick is done with BlackRock, he probably is going to pursue a career in politics. And that's the way we've seen. That's the norm in the United States as we see this revolving door going in and out of public to private. You know, if you think about America and why it's important in the world, uh, you know, we often refer to ourselves as the, you know, a superpower, the superpower. And that, that superpower is derived really from, you know, a few areas. One is military power, which I, I think is kind of declining for us in that, you know, the, there's disputes spread out all over the world, I think, as a relative, um, you know, superior strength as the technology of warfare is changing. Our lead is not what it once was. The second is the dollar itself. And we've seen we've tried to use that in lieu of military power in the Russia-Ukraine conflict, and it, it's been very ineffective. I mean, then the third is the internet, where we're exporting our values, our culture, um, and making the rules of the internet. And that was enabled because the internet largely got built in the United States, and you know, the government didn't undermine it. In fact, it um, promoted it. And that, that, that remains a huge source of power for the country and for the ideas that come out of the country currently and the kind of the American way of life, so, so to speak. And, you know, if we forfeit the next um, evolution of the internet to whomever, and there are many countries, by the way, who are, have been much, much better on crypto regulation to date, you know, as a, as a way to kind of preserve this ring of power, which has been what's been going on, um, you know, it's, it's one of the most destructive things we can do to the country. Uh, so, so it's a, you know, and, and, a, and a huge reason, um, you know, other than like I agree with Chris, it's in our interest because we, you know, like it's a good investment for us if it goes well. But like, you know, for the country, it's probably, you know, the most important thing that we're doing as a firm. People are missing the larger picture. The larger picture is that the U.S. dollar is going to be weaponized. And anyone that is opposing the U.S. dollar and forming a new currency like the BRICS nations that are branching off and trying to circumvent the dollar system are going to ultimately find themselves back into the dollar system. You see, dollars are going to get more expensive. While the U.S. is printing as much dollars as possible, they're raising interest rates. The rest of the world uses dollars and it is on a dollar standard, while BRICS nations are breaking off and doing these bilateral swaps and they're planning on doing this with tokenized commodities, but they're going to find themselves into trouble when they need to convert those tokenized commodities into dollars, which are now priced against dollars. Those dollars are going to be more expensive because interest rates are going to get higher and higher and higher. This is going to put a tremendous amount of pressure on BRICS currencies, and that's going to cause BRICS currencies to hyperinflate. And when they come running to the U.S. and asking them for help, the U.S. isn't going to help them because they chose to, to try to circumvent the dollar. 
So there is a bigger picture. This is economic warfare. Raising interest rates is just one part of this. And, and, and the BRICS nations are playing, playing the same game and they're trying to do this with energy and commodities, but everything is priced in dollars regardless. And like I said earlier, we're not missing the next internet. You could see once BlackRock decided to create a Bitcoin ETF, once they decided that they're going to tokenize securities, that's when all the regulations started pushing forward. This is just starting, and we're going to have front seats to an explosive show. And when you have a CBDC, it's effectively electronic, programmable money that comes from the central bank. And you can allocate where it goes and for what, and you can turn it on and off with a switch. It's not how money works, not how we're used to it in the West. So if they do that, you can have a fistful of dollars, absolutely, but you'll be buried in the sand of another group who can literally plan their economy. Here's enough money that's going to go from here to there just for this and for nothing else, or it turns itself off. So you can plan what you want to do. And the West, well, we don't do planning very well, do we? Look at Aussie infrastructure. So, you know, it's really not a fair fight. Oh, here they go. They've come back. Fantastic. So it's not just about the PBOC doing CN CNY TCF. It's going to be this CBDC. China is calling it the Embridge system. That's what they're calling it. It will allow for clearing, so settlement of currencies within this BRICS group. It supports state industrial policy and it will be a parallel system to the banking system called SWIFT that we use. So we're talking a parallel system. And it will be a parallel system to the banking system called SWIFT that we use. So we're talking a parallel system. China has created a central bank digital currency, and they are known to have capital controls, which means that they can turn people's money off, and they have and will turn people's money off. So the BRICS nations are coming about, and there's going to be there's going to be a need for a neutral public asset that's not a dollar. You see, BRICS nations right now have the plan to tokenize commodities, but the U.S. is it's going to fight back with tokenized commodities that bypass the dollar. Tokenized commodities are still going to be priced in dollars, so they're going to have somewhat of an advantage because they control interest rates. Economic warfare is going to be played out, and it's going to be played out with BRICS versus the U.S., and a lot of people aren't going to realize what's happening, but we're going to see geopolitical conflicts escalate greatly. Now, what does that mean for a farmer? Well, here's a bar of chocolate. Yum, yum. Obviously, you have inputs to go into that. Oil, diesel, cocoa, palm oil, sugar, nuts, and a lot of E numbers that I don't like. What if all of those inputs were in this new BRICS digital currency? So in order to get all the inputs, you've got to have that digital currency, but you don't have it because you're in the West and you're using the Aussie dollar or the Kiwi dollar or the US dollar on the SWIFT system? And what if there's no exchange rate between the two because of political reasons? Well, you know, you break the bar of chocolate in half. You have to have parallel bars of chocolate, parallel systems. And that's effectively what we're seeing. I could talk for an hour on this too. Part of what's happening is the US banking system is huge, much bigger than people realize. It's like 10 times the size of the Australian economy. It's about $20 trillion. But then the amount of dollars that flow offshore, US dollars that flow offshore, is around 80 to 100 trillion. There's an entire parallel global economy there. And the BRICS countries are saying, we don't want to be using the US dollar in a parallel economy outside the US because we don't like the US. We want to use commodities instead of the dollar. We want to trade with each other based on what we have, which is stuff. And we want to value that in a new currency that we trade with each other and eventually force the West to take from us. The BRICS nations are trying to bypass the dollar and they're trying to use commodities as a medium of exchange. Now, this is not exactly easy to do, but with tokenization, with decentralized finance, this is achievable. So the BRICS nations are going to be setting up bilateral swaps between one another and the way they're going to go about doing this 
is through this innovation. Now, they're not going to use centralized systems. They can't use centralized systems because you're recreating the same problem that the dollar system created. So we're naturally going to see an evolution that's going to move to trustless protocols, not trusted protocol. And so in order to push back against that, and trust me, the West will push back against that very, very hard. One thing that you can expect to see, and I've been predicting for quite some time, is that the US will raise interest rates. Because you can say on one hand, I've got a ship full of oil, or I've got a, a warehouse full of this particular commodity, and if the price keeps going up and up, why wouldn't you hold that? It's an accumulating asset in terms of value. But if you raise your interest rate to 5.5%, like the Americans have, maybe even 6%, that 6% risk-free, no need to store anything or worry about mice or, or leaks. And so the commodity price is less attractive, relatively. And so we expect to see higher rates for longer, for many reasons, not just due to inflation. And some of them will be to push down the value of BRICS 11 currencies, which is happening, they are collapsing. And to push down commodities, which they're trying to do, and to hit these shadow banks which operate offshore, which then are not regulated by the Americans. And importantly, if you get a crisis outside the US from people who have borrowed dollars and can't repay them, don't expect any help. The Americans are going to say, what have you done for me lately? Rather than bail you out. Here are the BRICS 11 FX, based at 100 in the year 2010. The Chinese currency in red is doing reasonably well, and that's not doing well at all. And the Brazilian currency has held up well in the last two or three years. Everybody else is going down the pan. So this game is already being played, even if we don't want to join the dots to see it. And as I said, if half the castle starts to crumble on the back of that volatility that we see in the BRICS countries, why would the US step in and say, well, we'll help you out. Here are more dollars. No. Emerging markets, particularly ones that aren't friendly with the US, could have a real crisis and they're all on their own if that does happen. There's a deeper play that's happening right now. There's a deeper hidden war, secret war, secret war that's right in front of everyone's face and involves economic warfare. You see, higher for longer, higher interest rates is not just a way to fight inflation. This first started when Russia got sanctioned and we saw energy prices spike. But you see, the United States is at much more of an advantage than people realize. The United States controls the interest rates on dollars, and they have the ability to squeeze everyone's debts and put a tremendous amount of pressure, so much pressure that it could cause hyperinflation in other countries. And when those other countries vow to bypass the dollar and join BRICS, and then they come to the U.S. asking for loans, asking for forgiveness, they're not going to get it. What happens then? Likely. You know, yeah. That's a real problem. Uh, I don't see, if it ends up open war, I, I don't see politically how it stays confined in Europe, depending on the administration. I think, and that's why the next six months are, are so critical and dangerous, because, you know, I don't, see a trump administration intervening if let's say france and poland get into a shooting war with uh with russia and then try to invoke the nato treaty i don't see the u.s under trump doing that um so but isn't it kind of likely based on the tea leaves that that such an intervention by france and poland would happen before the U.S. election, or not necessarily? Uh, yeah, I, it's got. I think it has to because Ukraine may not exist at the end of this year. Uh, I know that's a, a, a not. I, it's a, that's increasingly becoming aware to the U.S. public, but I think that by the end of this year, it'll be de facto partition. And I, again, I would not be surprised to see a Polish intervention in Western Ukraine, but they will studiously avoid attacking Russia. They'll basically move in, take those areas, and 
Russia had no intention of going into those areas anyway. That's another myth, by the way. Russia doesn't want all of Ukraine. They only want the, the traditional Russian areas of Ukraine. That's been very clear from their statements. So, so again, just to be clear, um, if we go to an open war with or without the U.S., you don't think that the, it will then be confined to Europe. And then, intentional or not, there are just multiple avenues of uh, a runaway escalation of response, counter-response, bigger response, nuclear weapons. So that we're, we're on that runway if this gets to an open war. That's what it feels like. Uh, I find it difficult to figure a way that the U.S. could lose a conventional war in Europe without going nuclear. And again, the conventional correlation of forces, uh, you know, there's a famous quote from Omar Bradley that amateurs study tactics and professionals study logistics. The logistics of a war with Russia over Europe just don't work for us. And so there was some princess bride quote to that effect. Yeah. <laughs> I, so yeah, I, you know, but I, I, so, so the implication, Chuck, then uh, the, the strong implication, the message that you're sending here is we have to avoid the open secret war turning into an open war. Yes, absolutely. And again, there's and how, no, how do we do that? Or is there a reasonable path forward to that? You know, it, it's, I think the way you do that, first off, there's domestic you know, there's political concerns because again, just like with, uh, France in fact, more so than with France, the Biden administration doesn't want to get stuck with the accusation. They lost Ukraine. Putin understands the energy markets quite well. You see in, in 2020, when oil went negative, that was not a result. It was not a direct result of C-19. There were some factors that played into it. One of the biggest factors was Russia jumped out of OPEC plus. They said no more, and they were going to produce as much oil as they please. Now, the BRICS nations are using energy as a weapon while the U.S. uses the dollar as a weapon. This is going to go tit for tat, and there are going to be a lot of frictions on global trade. There's a lot of uncertainty, and stability is something of the past. Everything relies on everyone's cooperation, and cooperation is ceasing to exist. So it's going to be a very difficult, mar very difficult to navigate markets during these conditions. Call it the era of techno feudalism, and thus the book that you kindly mentioned. I believe that this third era took root in the mid 2000s, but grew strongly after the GFC in conjunction with a rapid technological change that caused capital to mutate into a new form. I call it cloud capital. It's what lives inside your phone, inside your laptop. It's an automated means of behavioral modification. Consider the six things that cloud capital does. Where do you encounter it? When you go into Amazon.com, when you go into Uber. The six things that cloud capital does, it grabs our attention first. It manufactures our desires. Third, it sells directly to us the things that will satiate the desires that it has manufactured. Fourth, it drives and monitors workers in the workplace, whether the workplace is a factory, an Amazon warehouse, or the, the cab of a truck in which a driver monitored by the same algorithm works. Fifth, it elicits massive free labor from all of us every time we click, we like, or we post whatever we do on the internet. After the great financial crisis, the G7 banks printed a ton of money, and most of those money ended up into banks and into big tech. Big tech used this money to develop artificial intelligence and change and transform the way the internet works today. You see, there are powerful algorithms that are taking everything you do, everything you say, and using that as a way to manipulate, a way to control the masses. 
And this is now going to merge with assets. It's going to merge with markets. And we're going to see the Internet of Value combined with artificial intelligence and the big techs getting stronger, the big banks getting stronger. 180 million digital wallets that already are running, and they're not just used by Chinese. I know German entrepreneurs who use them because they buy aluminum from Shenzhen. They bring it to Germany, they make propellers for the shipyards in Shanghai, and then they send the, the propellers to Shanghai. Yeah? Instead of going to their bank managers in Deutsche Bank to send money to the Buddhist bank that goes to the European Central Bank, that goes to the Central Bank of China, that then goes to their private account uh, and makes a payment to get the aluminum, and then the whole process being reversed, uh, they have a digital wallet provided by the Central Bank of China, they make the payment by just Pressing one button, no fees, no questions asked, the money goes backwards and forwards. Why can the Chinese do this and we can't? It's not that the Reserve Bank of Australia can't do it or they have to look into it again and again. They can do it yesterday. The banks won't let them because they demand the monopoly of the payment system. And that is a scandal that they have it. Because, you know, if you ask an economic student, what, what is the role of a bank? They say, oh, they're intermediaries. They take deposits from Jill and they lend them to Jack. That's not what they do. That is a fiction. What they do is because in order to make a payment to have your lunch or to get a coffee from a coffee shop, you need to have a private account. Otherwise, there's, there's no card. Well, if the Reserve Bank gave them that card, then suddenly the banks would have to provide genuine services to their customers, something they do not want to do. <laughs> do Centralized entities like banks were once a value-added service. They were once a means to move money, a means to issue loans. But with decentralized finance, with crypto assets, trustless technologies, we can remove the banks entirely. And they're just not going to allow that. They're going to put up a fight. And this is what we're seeing. We're seeing the banks put up a fight in the same time that the world is falling apart and political geopolitical tensions are picking up every corporation every bank out there is self-serving every person is self-serving and politicians are self-serving so everybody's looking out for themselves and they don't see the bigger picture when the bigger picture finally erupts and finally implodes and BRICS nations no longer pay back their debts, their deficits. What happens to the entire system? Well, we'll undergo a reset, a reset that transforms the system forever and changes the way the global monetary system works. And we're in the midst of the reset right now. We are seeing this break out. And when, when these countries finally say we're not going to pay these debts, what happens from there? I can always make another dollar, but I cannot make another day. Thanks, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the show. Please take a moment to like and subscribe. If you enjoy content like this, please consider joining my Patreon or my Ghost site, dmjr.ghost.io. Thanks, guys.